Please open your Bible with me to the book of James this morning, James chapter 1. James chapter 1, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 11 together today. James chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith, without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position, and the rich man is to glory in his humiliation, because like flowering grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass, and its flower falls off, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too, the rich man, in the midst of his pursuits, will fade away. Well, let me invite you to open your Bibles and uh, turn with me, if you have not already, if you're still not there, in the book of James, which is where we are uh, now. We last week began with our introduction and overview of the book, just kind of looking at some of the big themes of what's taking place in the book of James overall. And today we're going to begin our deep dive, uh, verse by verse, making our way through James. And as we read a moment ago, we'll be looking at James 1. We looked at verse 1 last week. We're going to focus on verses 2 through 11 and we're going to make our way through those verses together uh, in just a moment. This last week, I, I asked my kids as we were talking, I said, uh, what do you like to do when you are having a bad day? What do you do that makes you feel better? Well, in a moment that maybe only happens in a pastor's home, one kid proudly announced, I like to read my Bible and pray. And another kid laughed and said, no, you don't. You just said that because dad asked. So I don't, I don't know if anybody else has those experiences. But once we got through the Sunday school answers, uh, the, the, the kids opened up and uh, Sam and Solomon said they like to read uh, a good book, helps them take their mind off things. Uh, my daughter said she likes to play with her cat. Apparently, my son Josiah has the best of both worlds. He said, I like to read to my cat. So I don't know. There's some secret maybe uh, in that. But other suggestions were watch a movie. Listen to music, play a game, all kinds of things to, to get your mind off of what you're, you're going through. You know, we all have different ways to respond to stress and frustrations and bad days. Some of you, you, you like to go to the gym, you know, let out some, some frustration and sweat it out. Others of you, the last place you want to go is to the gym. You'd rather go to the fridge, right, or the pantry. Uh, comfort food, right? It, it serves a purpose in, in our lives. But you know, we all go through different things and have different ways to respond. Some want a cup of coffee. Some want to listen to a certain song. Some like to be surrounded by friends. Others want to be just left alone. We, we all have different ways that we respond to, to bad days. Well, in our passage today, James wants us all to think about this very issue. And he assumes in this passage that, like it or not, we're all going to encounter bad days. We're, we're all going to encounter stresses and trials and, and frustrations. And so it's not a question of, are we going to go through this stuff? It's, what are we going to do when we go through this stuff? How should we respond to the trials and challenges of life? 
And, and the message of James in this passage is, is actually quite surprising and maybe uh, something we don't often think of. James says, as much as we don't like them, bad days can serve a good purpose in the life of a Christian. That bad days can serve a good purpose in the work of God and in the way in which He is shaping us and molding us. You know, Augustine said, tribulations are divine medicine. In other words, when we go through trials, sometimes we think they're hurting us and we, we want them to stop. But Augustine said, but wait a minute, sometimes those trials are actually healing us. They're doing something we don't recognize deep down in our soul and deep down in our midst. And I think James wants us to have that kind of insight, that kind of perspective, so that we can all respond to our trials in the right way. Because our tendency when trials come is to say, okay, stop, quit, leave me alone. But James would tell us, wait a minute, not so fast. There may be something going on. And there's a better way to respond than simply trying to, to get out of it and get away of it as soon as possible. You know, our world is, as Brother Steve said, our world is going through trials. Our nation's going through trials. Our our neighborhoods, our families as individuals, we're going through trials. And right now the church is, as a congregation, we're scattered. Some are here, some are not here, and we're all over the place. And James is going to remind this church that is scattered that the world is watching. And this is part of our witness. This is part of the way in which we show others who Christ is, is by how we respond to our trials. And if we respond to our trials the way that the world says, the way that the world responds to trials, what does that say about Jesus? Not a whole lot. And so James would say, no, no, Christians, brothers and sisters, pause. When a trial comes, think about how you're going to respond and respond in a way that's going to most glorify the Lord. What, what is that? What does that look like in our life? Well, in this passage, James is going to set before us Three ways to respond well to your trials. Three ways that you and I can respond well to our trials. You, you've heard the old cliche, you're either in a storm, coming out of a storm, or going into one. So it doesn't matter where you are, this passage is for all of us to equip us in responding to trials. Well, how do we respond? First of all, James tells us in verses 2 through 4, number 1, he tells us, appreciate what God is doing through your trials. Appreciate what God is doing through your trials. Notice verse 2. He says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Now that is a strange way to start. Imagine pouring out your heart and your tears to your counselor, and they got done, and you got done, and they say, Hey, I've got good news. You can count it all joy. You'd probably be a little bit, what are you talking about? Didn't you hear what I just said? This is, this is sad. I'm grieving. I'm going through hardships. What do you mean, count it all joy? Well, that's exactly what James says. And because this verse is so jarring, it can be easily under, uh, misunderstood. Some would say that, well, you know, trials and challenges, they're, they're, they're just in your head. You know, pain is an illusion, some say. James is pretty convinced, though, that that trials are real. In fact, notice how he describes them. James says, consider all joy, my brethren, when you encounter. He doesn't say if you encounter. We really don't have a choice in the matter. Trials are coming to all of us. We, we no doubt love the promises of Jesus, except for maybe that one where he said, in this world you will have trouble. That was promised to us. And James is reinforcing that, reminding us this, this is the reality of it. You see, I think sometimes this, this is where Instagram and advertising can poison our thinking because we turn on the TV and we flip through the phones and we see beautiful people in beautiful places doing beautiful things and we think, why can't my life be trouble-free like theirs? My friends, there is no such life. Everyone goes through trials. In fact, based on what James says here, we maybe should wake up every morning and assume to ourselves something bad's going to happen. And when it doesn't, we praise God for His mercy. 
James says, you, you will encounter troubles. What kind of troubles will we encounter? He says there, when you encounter various troubles. Now, the word encounter there, I, I love that Greek word there. It implies, imagine walking down a dark street and all of a sudden a, 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 a big bulking figure jumps out of the shadows in front of you. And, and it's frightened and you turn to run the other way, but as soon as you do, there's somebody else standing there. And so you turn to your left to run, but there's another guy there, and you turn to your right, and there's a guy there, and all of a sudden, what? You're, you're surrounded. That's actually what that word means here. You're going to encounter them. You're going to be surrounded by them. We, we've all heard the phrase, what, when it rains, it pours. That's what James says. Don't be surprised. This is how it works. This is how life is. You will encounter, you will be surrounded by not just trials, he says, various trials. If you don't know it already, trials come in all shapes and sizes and colors. If we made a list of what everyone was going through in this room, we would have a pretty assorted list of of things, would we not? Some of you are going through marriage issues, some parenting issues, some money issues, some emotional issues, some sort of mental issues. Some are going through friendship issues, relationship issues, having to wear a stupid boot while you preach. You know, there's, there's all kinds of issues. And some are big. Some are small. Last Sunday, as Brother Galen and I were talking, he preached this passage, uh, I think eight years ago, he said. And he preached this text, and that was the week they found out that Linda had cancer. We're going to encounter trials. All kinds of trials. It's not a question of this, it's a question of when. This is not an illusion. This is the world we live in. It's broken, it's messed up. So what do we do? James says, consider it all joy. Now that's a command. Count it as pure joy. James is saying that when bad stuff happens, when you have a bad day, up front recognize there's something to be glad about. And that something is this, God is up to something. God is doing something. It's not that you're, giving, you're rejoicing in the trial itself, but you're rejoicing, as he's going to say, in the results of the trial. It's not that we're saying this bad thing is good, but we're saying good is going to come out of this bad thing. And he says in the life of a Christian, that's, that's the perspective we must maintain. Pain has a purpose. And that purpose, as he will say, is sanctification. And sanctification is something to rejoice in. And so when hardships press in on us, joy should come out of us. It's like when you squeeze a bottle of mustard. What comes out? Toothpaste? Why? I hope not. Mustard, why? Because that's, that's what's on the inside. And so he says, when a, when, a, when a spirit-filled Christian gets squeezed by life on all sides, what comes out of us? Well, what should come out of us is, is joy. Joy in Christ, because that's a fruit of the Spirit, and the Spirit's at work. And we have this perspective. This is not just some hardship or difficulty, but rather it is God working sanctification deep down in me. And so he says, you need to appreciate this. What is God doing? He says there, verse 3, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Some of your translations say steadfastness. It means to stand up under the weight of something. Trials produce in us a kind of spiritual stick to like nothing else. Isn't that true? Some of the hardest moments in your life, if you look back on them, they oftentimes, they have been some of the most spiritually fruitful moments in your life. It's not that you want them, but it's through them that you you learn an endurance. And and James says here, that's what you need to understand. God is doing this work deep in you. As I look around this room and I think about our church, listen, there are a number of people in our church who have gone through some very hard trials who have gone through loss of spouse and sickness and illness and job issues and all kinds of things. And yet, as I think about all those people, you know what I remember? And I think, think about? 
you're still here. You didn't quit. You didn't give up. Why? Because the trial, if anything, it it helped you double down on your faith. It proved the certainty of your faith. It proved the sincerity of your belief in Jesus, that you're not just in this for the good times. You're in this for something else. And James says that, understand, this is the work that God is doing in you. Notice in verse 4, he says, and let endurance have its perfect result. That's also a command. It's kind of passive. Let it do something. When, when hardships come, as I said earlier, so often what's our tendency is to say, God, make it stop. Make it quit. I don't like this. I'm, I'm uncomfortable. Make, make, make it go away. And that's not always a bad prayer to pray, but James is saying here, don't do that too soon. If you pull a cake out of the oven too soon, it's not firm enough. And if you pull a Christian out of the fire too soon, their faith will not be firm enough. That's what he's saying here. God, He strengthens our faith. He grows us through the trials of life so that we have this assurance and our endurance pays off. And so he says, uh, the result is that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, I don't think he's saying here that we will be sinless or flawless, at least not in this life. Maybe he's talking about the life to come that certainly may be hinted in this. But I think when he says that you will be perfect and complete, he means that you will be whole or you will be mature. You will grow up in your faith in Jesus. God will bring about this this Christ. Now think about those, look at those words there, perfect and and complete, lacking nothing. It's as if he's describing that you're going to become more and more like who? Like Jesus. In fact, what does the Bible tell us? Romans chapter 8, verse 29. I know some Baptists don't like this word, but it's, it's in the verse. God has predestined... Yes, it's, that's the, He has predestined you, what? To be conformed into the image of His Son. He's told us up front, that's the plan. So bad stuff happens, and we say, why God? Why me? Why now? And God says, why not? I told you that I was going to make you like Jesus. And it's through the trials, through the hardships, through the bad days, that so often He's doing that. In fact, the book of Hebrews says that our Lord was, quote, made perfect through sufferings, that He experienced all of those trials and and, and showed perfect obedience to God, and this is one of the main ways that God does this in our life. So just think up front when trials and bad days and hardships and pink slips and illnesses, when all of those things happen, those trials are not a disservice to you. They actually truly are a great service to you to mold you and to shape you into the image of Jesus. And James would say, appreciate it. Count it all joy. Appreciate what God is doing. That word there, he says, the testing of your faith, that's actually a word that was used of uh, the process of purifying metals, like silver and gold. What do we do with them? You take silver and gold and you toss it into a, a hot fire and and eventually it melts it, but it brings those impurities. It brings those toxins to the surface so they can be scooped off and they can be scooped away. And what's left? A, a, a metal that is pure. It's refined. That's what pulls out those impurities. So often that's what God is doing. He is showing us what's lacking. He is showing us where we fall short so that He can mold us and shape us into the image of Jesus. What does that old hymn say? When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all-sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame will not hurt thee. I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. That's what He's doing in us. He doesn't put us in the fire to burn us. He puts us in the fire to purify us, to refine us, to make us like His Son, the Lord Jesus. And so when trials come, we pray, Dear God, fix this. Dear God, fix that. And He's saying, Dear child, I want to fix you. I want to grow you. I want to perfect and mature you. And that's why we need to appreciate what God is doing. Do you do do that? 
Do you stop and say, Lord, not thank you for the car breaking down, but thank you for what you're teaching me. Thank you for what you're doing in my heart. Thank you for for helping me to understand patience and humility and Him working these virtues deep within us because oftentimes we would not learn them if it was up to us. But He puts us in places where we will learn them. So James says that's the first thing you do. You need to respond by appreciating what God is doing. Number two, He tells us in verses 5 to 8, number two, we also should pray for God's wisdom during your trial. So appreciate what God is doing through your trials and then pray for God's wisdom during your trials. Now look at verse 4 real quick. Notice how verse 4 ends. He says, the goal is that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So James says there's going to come a day as we grow that will become more mature and, 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 and that will grow as we should and that we will, he says, lack nothing. But notice that day is not today because verse 5 says, but if any of you lacks wisdom. So James says there's coming a day when we will lack nothing, but when you're going through a trial, usually that's not the time. That's usually the moment when you realize acutely how much you lack, and what you don't have. And so he says here, those are the moments when we need to ask God for wisdom. God uses trials often to show us how short-sighted we are, how much we take for granted, how unwise we are actually in our priorities and lives. And so often the trials, they're to lead us into a deeper appreciation and a deeper sense of wisdom in what matters. He says here, let him ask of God. When we go through hardships, we often say, oh God, give me money to get out of this, this bill, or oh God, give me you know, a new job for this, or, or God, give me a spouse, or God, give me... And we ask for those things, and it's not wrong to ask for that, but James says, make sure at the top of your prayer list, you pray for wisdom. Let him ask for wisdom. I learned this many, many, many years ago, and if I'm, you can tell I'm having a bad day, or going through a trial, because I will walk around, and you probably won't hear it, because I don't mutter out loud, but I'm kind of like, I'm kind of like Rain Man. I will pray, Lord, give me wisdom. Like constantly. Lord, give me wisdom. 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 Because I know that's the thing he said he will give us in our trials. Let him ask God for, now what is wisdom? Well, wisdom is not just knowledge or intelligence. Wisdom is is so much more. It includes knowledge. But wisdom is not so much about thinking right as it is about living right. If I can say it this way, knowledge is book smarts. Wisdom is street smart. Right? I mean, wisdom is to know what to do. When God came to Solomon and said, I'll give you whatever you want, what did he say? He says, give me a discerning heart to choose between good and evil. Right? In other words, I need to know how to make the next choice, how to make the next step, what, what to do next. It's not just I need to know all the information. It, it's how do I actually go about making that next step and making that first decision. He says that's what we ask of God is to help us in moving forward. Adrian Rogers said wisdom is seeing life from God's point of view. Isn't that what we lack in trials? We don't see it from his vantage point. We only see it with the narrow view of my pain and my suffering. But no, no, wisdom says, okay, God, you're humbling me, you're teaching me, Lord, give me that understanding. Maybe you've prayed that prayer before. James says, good, then do it again. In fact, the word ask here means keep on asking for wisdom. Make it your habit. Every fresh trial needs a fresh prayer for fresh wisdom. Give me wisdom, O Lord, he says. That's what we should pray. And notice why we should ask God for wisdom. Because he says in verse 5, It is he who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. James says here that, that God is not stingy. Think about that. God is not reluctant. We don't have to twist his arm for wisdom. In fact, James is saying here that God is more eager to give you wisdom than you are to even ask God for wisdom. He is so rich in wisdom, he he is a big spender wanting to hand it out. And so he says here, just ask. Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, Jesus said what? 
if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give, give, give good gifts, well, that's hard to say, give good gifts to those that, what? Ask Him. That's what it is. We ask Him. We don't have to manipulate Him. He doesn't get mad at us because we didn't ask for it yesterday. He's just glad we came today. Ask for wisdom. By the way, wisdom is not for sale. You can't buy it from Amazon. It is a gift given to us by God. And so he says he will, he will give us wisdom. God's ladle is always tilted towards the bowl of his children, wanting to pour out wisdom to us. We just need to ask. James will later warn us, make sure when you ask, though, that you ask with right motives. He won't answer the prayer when you're asking with wrong motives. But he says he will give you, notice the word there, generously. The old King James says he will give liberally. And so he says, in this life you're, you're guaranteed trials, but listen, if you pray as you should, you are also guaranteed wisdom. He will give it to you. And by the way, can I just point out, this may be hard to get, but notice again, look closely at verse 5. He doesn't promise that He will give us the answer or even the solution. He says He'll give you the wisdom. That's different. So often we think, what I need is the answer, and God is saying, no, no, what you really need is, is wisdom. So if trials require wisdom, and wisdom requires prayer, then prayer requires faith. Look at verse 6. But he must ask in faith without any doubting. So James says here, you need wisdom. The way to wisdom is prayer, and prayer needs to be done in faith, believing and trusting God. Now, James is not changing the subject here. He's just diving deeper in this thought. What does it mean to ask God for wisdom? It means to do it with sincere trust in God. Now, I don't think he is saying here that, well, if you're a Christian, you can never have doubts or have questions. I don't think that's what he's saying here. I think the man he's describing here in verses 6, 7, and 8 is a a person who has deep-seated reservations about God. He's not sure that God is really God and that God is really good. It's not that he just has some questions and he's unsure. It's that this man has, as he's going to describe here, this sort of divided loyalty about God. And so he kind of throws up a prayer like a, uh, we would say a Hail Mary. Just, okay, God, maybe, maybe this will work, but maybe it won't because I'm not even sure you're real or you're there or whatever. Whatever. He says, don't be that man. Be the person that prays who comes to God, notice, without doubting. Because the one who doubts, he says, is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. If you've been to the beach and you've seen the waves, you know that between the morning and the evening or even just hour to hour, waves constantly change. Some are big and some are small. Some are shaped one way, some are very shaped another way. Some have a great intensity, some have a lesser intensity. No two wave is exactly the same. James is saying that this man is like a wave who bounces back and forth between faith and skepticism. He bounces back and forth between, yes, I trust God, and no, I don't really trust God. And so he kind of wants to have his cake and eat it too. And James says God's not going to answer that man's prayer. He's not going to hear him. Because he is why? He says he is a double-minded, verse 8, double-minded man. This is one of those words that James uh, invents. He is doubting and hesitating. There's two things going on at the same time. My my kids, they love uh, Batman. And if any of you know Batman, there's a character in Batman whose original name is Harvey Dent. Let me know who Harvey Dent is already. Uh, Harvey Dent was a a, a lawyer who, in a strange turn of events, he has uh, acid, I think it is, thrown at him, and his face gets burned. And so half of his face is fine, and half of his face is totally melted. Some of you have seen the character. And he he becomes this villain known as Two-Face. So one face is, it looks fine from one angle. The other side is just, just, 
you know, evil and twisted and nasty. And so he becomes this man who's, who's duplicitous. He, he, he's constantly bouncing back and forth. And you know how he makes all of his decisions? How Two-Face does? He flips a coin. So he's very unpredictable as a villain because you don't know what he's going to do. It's just, it's kind of chance. He flips the coin, whatever happens, heads or tails, who knows? That's the kind of man that James is describing here. It's not a person who comes to God in faith and it maybe even has questions. It's a man who says, well, let's just flip the coin and see if God can get me out of this. Maybe he can. Maybe he can't. Who knows? No, James says God will not answer that man's prayers. That man is unstable in all his ways. No, James is not calling us to be unstable. He's calling us to be stable. He's calling us to be firm in our faith and not to have that kind of divided loyalty. This man won't fully commit himself to God because he wants to keep his options open. And James says that man shouldn't expect to get anything from God. God is not option C among many options. We come to God in full faith, trusting that He will provide what we need. So when you're going through trials, brothers and sisters, be sure that God has your undivided attention and your undivided loyalty and even your undivided prayers. That it's not just, God, bail me out because I'm going through this, but rather, Lord, I know that you're doing something in me and I trust you. And the most humble prayer that we can learn to pray is very simply, God, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. In fact, I think he's answering a question that he's already asked uh, in, in verse 2. How do you rejoice in trials? Well, that takes wisdom. Right? How do you learn to have that perspective? That takes insight that's not natural. So if you want to do the first part, he says, be sure you do the second part. Ask God for wisdom, and he will show you how to rejoice in your trials. He will show you how to endure. He will show you how to press on and be steadfast. He will give you the wisdom to do the things that He's already commanded you to do. I I can't tell you how many of you I've talked to you over the years, and even some recently, you've gone through tough stuff and hard things. And even one, just a few weeks ago, I was talking to a church member who was going through something, and she looked at me and she said, Pastor, I have never prayed more than I have right now in these last two weeks. Listen, that's that's not an accident. Trials revamp our prayer life. And they should drive us to our knees and show us how little we understand and show us how foolish we are and how much we need to depend on God. Our world says, I can do it on my own. And and the, the Christian says, no, I need God. I need His wisdom. And so number two, we pray. We pray for God's wisdom. Third and finally, James will tell us, not only do we appreciate what God is doing and we pray for God's wisdom, number three, he tells us to cherish the spiritual riches from your trials. Cherish the spiritual riches from your trials. Now, if you noticed in the reading earlier, verses 9, 10, and 11, they they kind of of come out of nowhere. Did Did you notice it almost reads like James is changing the subject? Because he starts talking about the rich and the poor. Now some think, yeah, James has just moved on. He's he's changed the, the topic here. I don't think he has. I think James is giving us a real life example of a trial. Think about it. One of the most common trials to life that we all go through is money. Whether you have it or you don't. And both extremes come with their own hardship and their own challenges and their own trials for our souls. And so I think James, is he is setting up a topic for later in the book, but I think he's giving us an example of a various trial. Notice, first of all, he speaks of the brother of humble circumstances in verse 9 and contrasts him in verse 10 to the rich man. Now, the ancient world, they did not have a middle class like we think of today. There was pretty just one of two options. You were rich or you were poor. There wasn't quite this this sort of middle ground. And there wasn't a whole lot of economic mobility. You know what I mean? There's not a lot of rags to riches story. Usually if you were born poor, you stayed poor. 
You just kind of eked out an existence. And if you were born rich, you often stayed rich. And so these, this sort of classes, this sort of uh, economic distinctions were very sharp. And so it was obvious who was rich and who was poor. And many of the Christians, they were, verse 9, they were brothers and sisters of humble circumstances. They had very little to speak of. These are the kinds of people who, whose apartment is small that they rent. And if they own a car, it's, it breaks down often. Their job pays very little and they have few benefits and they can't seem to make ends meet or get ahead. And as a result, they're in humble, literally humbling circumstances. It's, it's hard for them to get by. Now let's be honest. In the eyes of our world, I, I'm sad to say, money often equals importance. It really is true. But my friends, in the eyes of God, just because someone has insufficient funds does not mean they have an insignificant life. And James would say to the brother or sister who has humble circumstances, who is poor, who is needy, he says, you're going to be overlooked by the world, you're going to be marginalized by the world, you're going to be outcast by the world, you're going to be embarrassed by the world. He says, but you need to take pride in something. He says, you need to take pride in, boast in, glory in, what? Your high position. In the eyes of the world, the poor, they have the lowest position, the lowest on the low, and oftentimes the poor Christians were even lower in the eyes of many. And he says, listen, no, no, time out. Even though that's a trial, that's a hardship that you go through, you have something to rejoice in, and that is that you have a high position. Now, what does he mean by that? I want to show you what he means in a moment. I want to come back to that. But notice then, he also says a word, verse 10, to the rich man. The rich man likewise is to glory or boast in something. But it's not his high position. He's to boast in what? His humiliation or his low position. Now, there's a big question among commentators and seminary eggheads as to whether or not this rich man is a Christian. Did you notice in verse 2 he calls him a brother, the the poor guy, but he doesn't call verse 10 a, a rich brother. He just says a rich man. Now, I don't know for sure if he's a Christian or not. Uh, it's, it, there's, a, there's a lot of good reasons in sort of both arguments. But I think either way, his point is clear. James is saying, remember, you who are rich, that in this world, money often equals importance. And in the eyes of the world, you, th- you are told that you're great and you're powerful and that you have all of these things. But remember, if you're going to be part of the kingdom, blessed are the poor in spirit. That's where your standing is. And so for the poor man, he says, get your chin up. And for the rich man, he says, put your head down a little bit. You need to realize that you don't stand before God the way that you stand before men. You're not seen by God the way that you're seen by men. And that's his message to both of them. In verse 11, he talks about how riches pass away. He gives this great picture of how the flowering grass is burned up. The sun with a scorching wind withers the grass and it falls off and and its appearance is destroyed. Then look at verse 11. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. Listen, if you're here this morning and you have a lot, put a lot of stock, a lot of value in your job and your work and your employment... Can I just warn you for a moment? Your corner office and that new contract and the work that you just began that seems so important, that is no guarantee that you will be here tomorrow. It could be gone before you go to bed tonight and you could be gone with it. That's what he says. He will pass away. Don't think that your money and status is going to give you this perseverance. No, James says what you need in perseverance is the perseverance of your faith because your money's not going to last. You need something that's going to last. And how do you do that? By humbling yourself before God. That's the, the riches of the rich man is his humble relationship before the Lord. 
So once again, what's the contrast here? I think it's so often in our world, money gives us access. It gives us access to the best schools and the best neighborhoods and the best cliques and the best groups. Without money in our world, so often we get no access. And James is saying, listen, to the poor brother who has no access in this world, no access to those things, who has very little to speak of, he says, brother, be encouraged that you by faith have access to the throne of God. That is your high position. And in fact, I think his point is, money can't buy you the stuff that's going to last. What does he say that you need? You need wisdom. Money can't buy wisdom. Only God can give you that. You need sanctification. Money can't buy you sanctification. Only God can give you that. We need joy. Where does joy come from? Money can't buy you that either. And so he says, the poor brother, you have all of these riches in Christ. You have all of these riches by faith. Get your head up, he says, in glory and boast in what God has given to you. And those of you who are rich, he says, be careful. Your money won't get you everything. You have to begin with a humble relationship with God. To humble yourself and realize your money, your house, your cars, your stuff, One day it'll be gone. And when the trials of cancer come, when the trials of hardships come, it won't be able to give you what you need. What you need comes only from God. So if you are a Christian, listen, if you define who you are, whether rich or poor, by your bank account, James says, you've already failed the test. Instead, you need to define who you are, whether you are rich or poor, by your relationship with God. And if you are poor, then your relationship with God is of high status. And if you are rich, then your relationship of God is one of a humble status. And all of us before Him stand equally at the foot of the cross, knowing that these riches are ours in Christ. Paul says it this way in 1 Timothy 6, Instruct those who are rich in this present age, not to be conceited. Isn't that the temptation? If I've got money and I've got power and I've got importance, then I have everything that I need and I'm going to hold on to my kingdom. And, and, and Paul says, don't be conceited. Don't put your hope in the uncertainty of riches. Young people, as you look towards your future and you look towards a job and you look towards what's ahead of you, don't put your hope in, the, in success. Don't put your hope in the uncertainty of riches. Put your hope in God. And humble yourself before Him or take pride in the fact that you can stand before Him and that in both cases, what you have are the riches in Jesus. Augustine was right. Trials are divine medicine. Trials can heal the rich man of his greed and of his pride. And trials can heal the poor man of his shame and his disgrace when they both understand that what is theirs is theirs by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And money can't buy it. It is a free gift of God. And nothing in this world can take it away. Why? It is a free gift of God. And it is ours, as we count it all joy, that He is enduring us and making us perfect and complete so that we will lack nothing. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for Your Word. Lord, thank You for the message of James, even as this book begins, and how it challenges us to rethink our trials and hardships. And Lord, I know that some walked into this room with the cloud hanging over their head, with the weight of this week on their shoulders. I pray that now, O Lord, Holy Spirit, I pray that You will grant to them fresh eyes to see what You're doing. And Lord, we pray that as Your children, we would value the world and value one another, not as the world says or as the world sees, but as You see us. And may we see ourselves accordingly. Lord, we pray that those of us that have means, that we wouldn't find our confidence in those means. And those that lack, 
May they not be defined by lack, but may they be defined by what they have in Jesus. And may whatever trial we have, may it cause us to run in faith to you that we might grow and be matured in Jesus. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.